This is Duke University. So I began to be interested in food aid and food assistance uh, during my master's thesis work, which looked at food aid targeting. And so what we were trying to understand was whether or not food aid was making it to the folks who needed it most. So the folks who were either most food insecure or uh, most impoverished. And what we found is that food aid does a pretty good job, but not a great job. And what I was then really interested in is around the same time, there was a lot of rhetoric around food aid dependency. And this is this notion that food aid, receiving food aid will make you need more food aid in the future because it'll either um, disincentivize labor or it will hurt your ability to produce locally, uh, produce crops locally because the food aid will depress local prices, um, et cetera. And so this notion of food aid dependency really kind of struck a chord with me because it seemed so unlikely based on my findings in, in my, my dissertation, I mean, in my master's thesis work, so I um, received a Fulbright to go to Bangladesh to look at food aid dependency. And the reason why Bangladesh was such an interesting place to do this work is at the time it was the number one recipient of food aid in the world. Um, this was in the mid 2000s, so 2006. What I found when I got there was that the notion of food aid dependency was completely irrelevant to people's lives. And what we ended up, what I ended up discovering was that food aid in fact is a a kind of source of power for um, for people who are kind of powerful within the community. It's a source of power within households. And so folks couldn't rely on food aid because the folks who were supposed to be getting it were only sometimes the ones, in fact, who did. And so this kind of, kind of made me rethink this whole notion of targeting a little bit where suddenly kind of on the ground, this, this idea that targeting is this very important and effective way of making food aid more efficient didn't really work or translate because the folks who were supposed to be getting food aid weren't. And because there were so many kind of power dynamics going on within these communities that kind of the, the notion of, of, of kind of trying to improve food aid um, through targeting or even worrying about dependency just seemed kind of completely um, kind of um, completely missing, or not completely missing the mark, but not quite kind of hitting what needed to be kind of touched upon. So as a result, um, I then started to think more about the role of power in communities, and that led me to do a, a PhD in sociology, which I'm, I'm trying to finish now, um, because I was struggling with how does one incorporate power into economics, and folks can do it, but I couldn't, I'm sure. <laughs> Maybe folks can do it, but I couldn't figure it out. And so thinking through kind of a sociological perspective has allowed me to kind of incorporate more nuanced ideas around food aid and food security. Um, that said, at the same time, there's some really interesting political things happening among um, kind of within the food aid discourse internationally, specifically trying to figure out how to deliver a broader set of tool of, of food assistance um, instruments to um, to communities, so thinking beyond food aid. And actually, initially, cash was seen as an alternative because maybe cash wouldn't make people you know, dependent on food aid um, or dependent on transfers. And that, in fact, has created all sorts of, of kind of debates that this is, you know, that cash may be different than food aid, or how is it different, or is it, in fact, different? So there's a lot of, of kind of umbrella categories that cash is called, um, but cash can mean either envelope stuffed with cash, it can mean an ATM card preloaded with cash, or it can mean telephones, um, kind of telephone transfers of cash. It can also mean vouchers, uh, and it could be vouchers that are either limited to a kind of a subset of products um, that are redeemable for, for maybe this long list of commodities, or there could be vouchers that are kind of open wide to anything in a particular shop, or it could be vouchers that where you kind of deliver your voucher and you get something like a predetermined basket. Um, oftentimes people make a distinction between cash and kind of vouchers and there's a very kind of um, active community 
uh, that is very strongly advocating for cash. And the reason why oftentimes is because folks believe that households and re recipients know how to use cash better and can use cash for what they need more than a humanitarian agency that delivers a kind of a predetermined basket of goods. Um, so there's this, this kind of underlying kind of notion that, that, that folks know what they need and that we should as it, as international agencies, let them make those choices themselves. Um, some other folks disagree with that and are extremely concerned about um, you know, some of the gender differences that, that, or some of the gender inequalities that might be exacerbated through um, giving cash. Um, cash and food are not treated the same way in households often. And cash and food, in some of my research, look like they're not treated the same way within communities. So if you're giving a community you know, community-wide distributions of food that might have kind of different ramifications around sharing um, within community within the community among those who maybe need it and who aren't getting it than cash transfers would, um, whereas cash is maybe a little bit people are maybe a little less willing to share cash. So there's this concern about power that maybe dampens some of the the advocacy around cash. Um, exactly. So there are um, there are a handful of studies out there that show that that people depending on who receives the, the assistance, their um, folks maybe prefer one or the other, and the way those, um, that assistance is spent can also vary. However, it, it depends a lot on the specific country. Um, the study that I'm thinking of that was done in Bangladesh asked men and women whether or not they preferred cash or food, and um, men generally preferred cash women who were married often preferred food, whereas widows preferred cash. And to me, this speaks of issues of power. And so widows are able to spend cash as they choose, but women who are married may not be able to do so. Um, that said, this is a, a very kind of established concern within kind of the both the academic community and the kind of practice community or community of practice. So there have been a number of different suggestions of, of how one might address these sorts of issues. And one is to try and give the, the, give the female access to the transfer directly. Um, another is to kind of generate advocacy campaigns around how women should be using this primarily for food, and so therefore it shouldn't be diverted to other sorts of things. I haven't seen very much in the way of, of whether or not that's effective, um, in part because it's really hard to do comparison sorts of studies. So you're kind of like, well, this seems to work compared to I don't know what. Um, Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.